Hello, welcome to today's episode of Juicing the Numbers. I am your host, Joshua Tracy. And I am your host, Corwin Heller. Now, we are both hosts. We are. We are. Uh, mother. It's it's the movies edition of Juicing the Numbers. The, the days of the music edition are numbered um, as sports have returned. Corwin and I have been in discussions of what we wanted to do since we have both enjoyed the the revelation that is the movies edition but both are looking to now pivot back to sports since this is first and foremost a sports podcast and the world of sports has resumed so uh in that discussion we've decided to start a new podcast to be named later uh that you know we'll 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 figure that part out um that will be strictly movies uh right now we're looking just to give a full transparency what we're thinking we're thinking the first episode end of this month like uh the 25th so it doesn't interfere with anything else um so if you're looking to continue if you've been enjoying the movies edition and you want to keep up with the with us as we watch new old and everything in between films uh we're hoping to have a new second show third day a week of the two of us talking about movies and shit yeah, it should be a lot of fun. It will be exactly the same as what we have right now, but it's new, and that makes it more exciting. So, yeah, it'll have a new name. There'll be new artwork. That's also TBD. It'll be a whole new experience. It'll be a whole new way to consume exactly what you're consuming right now. <laughs> <laughs> we could have changed literally nothing and not told you about it at all, and nobody would have noticed a thing. That's right. <laughs> um Hopefully by the next episode we have a name for this so we can better give you an idea of like what to look for and you know basic marketing ideas but uh for right now all we have is the loose concept of a new show and we're excited to share that with you. <laughs> <laughs> uh anyway Corwin are you ready to start today's episode? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. Uh let's start with oh fuck pick one buddy. <laughs> Uh, let's start with, I want to finish with Frost Nixon. So let's, okay. That's kind of what I was thinking too. All right, cool. Cool, 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 cool. All right. We were going to do eight and a half, 1963's eight and a half written and directed by Federico Fellini starring Marcello Mastroianni, Anouk I May and Claudia Cardinal. Um, I can't believe I didn't flub over any of those names. I am very proud of myself. I'm wildly impressed. I can't believe it anyway. Um, I Do I have an estimated budget? Doesn't look like I have one. Uh, I don't see one. Uh, it has a <laughs> cumulative worldwide gross of um, either $133,000 if you're looking at IMDb um, or $3.5 million if you're looking at Wikipedia, so who knows? <laughs> I love how these are wildly disparate numbers. Um, I do not see a tagline. Oh, yes, I do. This is a, oh, this is a terrible tagline. It's very long. Um, the tagline is, This is the story of Guido and his wife and his mistress and the innocent beckoning young girl and all the women in his life, past and present, and how they became a living part of his erotic fantasies. That's the tagline. Um, the description is a harried movie director retreats into his memories and fantasies. <laughs> Very different. Hmm. The tagline they should not be longer than the description. Like three words long if it was said in Italian. They probably have super specific words for it. I hope so. Hmm. Um, it won two Oscars on five nominations. It won for Best Costume Design, Black and White. This is back when the Oscars had... Um, color awards and black and white awards because there was a large contingency of films being made still in black and white in the 60s um although there was a mass transition over to color film to color photo no color film i was right the first time um so for a little while there they differentiated the categories obviously now they do not and it's just one category but this is from the time which they did um it also won for best foreign language film for italy it was nominated for best director for federico fellini best writing for federico fellini ennio flaiano see that's what i was expecting uh tulio pinelli and brunello rondi all of those could be pasta uh <laughs> and it was also nominated for best art direction set direction black and white for pierre p 
Piero Gerardi, Gerard, Gerardi, which uh, sounds like chocolate. Um, Corwin, <laughs> Corwin, what did you think of this film? Um, I didn't know there was a guy named Gerardo Girardi in it, but man. P- Piero Girardi. I'm sorry? Piero Girardi. Oh, I misheard you and now I'm sad. Damn. I am sorry. Uh, it is what it is. Uh, the gist of it is basically, I feel like I should have liked this movie more, and by all means, I don't have anything inherently that I dislike about it. I just never was able to get drawn in, and it's kind of, oh, how do I want to phrase it? It's kind of muted my response, just because even though it's it's there, and I enjoyed it, and it was everything I could have you know, by all means asked for, it's, I just never connected to it. It was a fun story. It was a great character. Guido is so much fun to watch. Um, You know, he makes you feel happier knowing how happy he's making these shitty situations. That's what I took from it. But overall, it's just kind of like, I I feel bad for not connecting. But yeah. It's a very meta film, I feel like. Oh, it's insanely meta. It's it's part autobiographical um, for Federico Fellini. The title in of itself is reflective, reflexive of that. Um, eight and a half is the number of films Guido had... Sorry, not Guido. That's the character's name. Federico had directed up until that point. This is his eighth film, and he had co-directed a film. That's where the half comes from. Um, and large parts of this are supposed to be um, either Federico's uh, experiences or his memories. So um, I would, I would definitely, this is definitely a very personal film, which I think comes off in how perfect I think the dialogue is. Um, as I'm sure most of these are probably conversations to however large of an extent um, Federico Fellini has had with other people. Um, mm-hmm. I, I love this film. Um, it, it, I, so, all right, I have a difficult time trying to describe what I'm going to try to describe. So let me know if it makes sense. Um, I love this film. I think it's perfect in so many ways. I often find my attention wandering. I really was struggling with that a lot. I don't know why. I think it's, it's one of those films where it's like most people who watch it in Italian are going to have that issue and it's no problem because it's so much dialogue and it's really just something you're supposed to, not even supposed to, but could easily just listen to. And the visuals on screen don't really add a significant amount to the overall experience. It really is significantly just the dialogue. I would would actually say the visual adds a lot. I'm sorry? I would actually say that the visuals add a lot. I feel like in those like dream sequences they do, but so much of it is just him sitting around a table, him sitting with other people. Yeah, there's some you know silent flirtations or looks that are shared between them, but it's all something you can still understand from either inflection or word choice, whatever it may be. And I feel like if you spoke Italian, it would be a lot easier to. Just kind of, I don't want to say understand, but, you know, digest it all. And it wouldn't be as bad to wander throughout. It's definitely dialogue heavy. So I certainly understand that being a reason. I think for me, it's also going to be a dialogue heavy reason. But in a different context, I think for me, so much is always happening. It's like, it's like jogging, you know, like, I, yeah, I want to keep going, but boy, am I tired. <laughs> boy, could I... Like, none of the scenes really let you sit with the scene. It The mo- the film moves incredibly quickly. Uh, or, sorry, the yeah. scenes, I should say, change or are so packed with shit that, like, there's just a lot to digest. And it's not... It's somewhere for me in between, like, a normal movie a normal dialogue laden film and watching the holy mountain because there's a lot of stuff happening in this that's definitely metaphor 
you know like there's there's so much visual metaphor happening as well that it's like oh man do i spend time trying to figure out what that is and then bam next scene and you don't really get a break and i think i have (laughs) an easier time with it with the holy mountain because you go all right i'm not even gonna try (laughs) we're just gonna let this one happen um but with this it's like it's personal enough and understandable enough that you want to try to break it down but by the time i start getting to a conclusion they they'd be doing the next thing and that's tough to do for two hours and 18 minutes yeah okay i get that it i like at the end of the day i do just feel like i'm missing out on that next layer of I guess both understanding and appreciation. Um, and I feel like if I watched it through a second time, it would either easily come to me or I'm giving up on this and that's it. I feel like the former is significantly more likely. Um, but it's just, it's hard to dive into it when I spent so much of, you know, the first, um, what is it, first watch through, just trying to figure out what's going on. I I think a good example that we could talk about is like the very first scene of the movie. Um, Guido's sitting in traffic and like he, people are like looking at him and he's, and his car is filling with carbon dioxide or monoxide. Which one is it? Uh, monoxide. Monox. Okay. Carbon monoxide. Sorry, chemists. <laughs> Sorry, grandpa. <laughs> My grandfather's a chemist. <laughs> um, and like, he's like panicking and everyone's looking at him. And that's, that's clearly, I think, him having a meltdown, I would, I would think, and struggling with that. And then it cuts to him in the sky and you go, all right, head in the clouds. Like, but now it's like, all right, how deep are we going to go with this? Like, is he just like head in the clouds daydreaming? Is, is death factoring into a large extent here? He's got a rope on his ankle and then gets pulled down um and, it, and that's i get that's him like being brought back down to reality but like how much am i how much more am i supposed to read into that because that feels like i could read into that a whole lot or say what i just said him being brought down back down to reality and then just move on but the thing is the second you want to have that thought it's like all right boom like we're he's walking on the beach with the guy and they're talking about something like we're, we we've moved on, buddy. That was your time to figure that part out has elapsed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like that first, you know, handful of scenes was, you know, for me, just like, okay, is this another holy mountain? Like, yeah, really gonna suffer through this. And for a significant part of that introduction, that's like the only thing I could think of, and it was, you know back to me like am i gonna be fucking cursing job out on the podcast this week because i have to watch someone boil shit or whatever it is <laughs> um if you do not understand that reference please go watch the holy mountain <laughs> hey uh other side of the podcast saying just don't just accept that you don't know the reference and move on with your life <laughs> watch it twice <laughs> I, I am glad that that you didn't dislike this i'm glad that you are tentatively liking this um mm-hmm. So let let's go over, I guess, the the plot, and we'll leave some mo- probably most of the metaphor to the side. Um, the character Guido, played by uh, Marcello Mastroianni, who's a wonderful actor, um, one yeah, of the very was, was huh? significantly the best part of the movie. Just oh my god, he's there. he's great. Um, he's also one of the few uh, non. English speaking actors that like has been nominated for Oscars before. He is a three time Oscar nominated actor. Um, huh? No, he actually, and that's the crazy part. He actually wasn't nominated for an Oscar for this, um, which really I think speaks to how, how great he is in his other roles. He was nominated for uh, Divorce Italian Style, which is uh, not a Federico Fellini film. He was nominated for A Special Day, which is also not a. De- oh, he wasn't nominated for any. Federico Fellini films. I thought he was nominated for La Dolce Vita. Uh, anyway, he was nominated for uh, Divorce, Italian Style, A Special Day, and Dark Eyes. 
Um, so but he's also sorry, many go. nominations. Yes, and he's also wonderful in all of his Federico Fellini films that he's in, uh, including this Eight and a Half um, and La Dolce Vita, which is the other like main Federico Fellini film to watch. Um, the La Dolce Vita is where the term paparazzi comes from. Huh. Yeah, one of the characters in that film is uh, a piece of shit whose whole job is to take unflattering pictures of celebrities, and that guy's name is Paparazzo. Uh, I thought it was just photographers that really didn't like paparazzi and just got the name wrong. No, no, it is the plural of a character's name from La Dolce Vita. Good. I mean, I've never seen it. Great movie. Uh, that's actually one of the things. Like this is this is very different from Federico Fellini's other films because most of them are pretty straight. And this is pretty straight up in terms of like the baseline story. Uh, if you take out the childhood memory parts, maybe um, it's relatively. Eh, it, it's this is a lot more metaphorical and visually ambitious than his films usually get. Um, but anyway, it's about a director, um, Guido who is trying to make a sci-fi film, but having director's block, so to speak. He doesn't quite know what he wants to do, what characters he wants the actors they already hired to play, which actors to hire to play characters that are in the movie, um, what he wants the sets to look like. And apparently it's a huge budget film and he hasn't made any decisions and he just doesn't know what to do. Um, and he's kind of navigating his interpersonal relationships with his wife and his mistress. Um, he is trying to bounce ideas off of a film critic that just eviscerates him, which is uh, very funny. Um, he navigates... It, it's kind of... It's really just kind of that. It's just him trying to figure out what he should do with this movie. Um as he encounters different aspects of who he is as a person, uh, religiously, uh, sexually, um, partnership wise with his wife, all these types of things. Um, and at the end, I don't think he has any answers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, the ending of the movie just kind of was like, yeah, it, it was more of a acknowledging of the situation and not nearly as much of, not a climax, but uh, what's the term that I'm clearly forgetting? The summation, a uh, uh, close of the arc, uh, closure. Yeah. Um, I can't think of the term either. Yeah, it it is very much so just an acknowledgement of what this what this story is. Um, from from just a story perspective, I love this idea. Um, and I love the fact. It's such a great joke because here you have a guy who's definitely supposed to be largely emulating Federico Fellini and you see him having director's block. Meanwhile, this is probably Federico Fellini's most directorially ambitious film. There's so much happening in this film. Every time Guido is like stuck and like talking about how stuck he is, there's something wacky happening. And it continuously cuts back to like very interesting and metaphorical memories from his childhood. Um, and so it's so hilarious and interesting to see this guy struggle with, how, man, how do I make this sci-fi film? While there's all sorts of really interesting and engaging things happening around him, it, again, and as we've been saying, even just the conversations. Um, uh, so I, I really like that aspect of it. Would you say that this is one of your favorite Italian language films, foreign language films, films. Italian language for sure. Yeah, I wouldn't go. It's tough because I think I like La Dolce Vita more than this for Italian language because it's just easy to it's easier to digest and i i love the story but i i get a certain satisfaction out of watching this because i just find it to be such a fascinating picture i uh, the thing is i'm having a hard time really 
breaking down what I love about it because the only two things I really have constructively to say about it are, wow, some of the things that are happening here are hilarious and weird, like kids taking bath, communal baths and wine. That's yeah. a scene in the movie. Um, or just good conversation, and it's so tough to talk about in a review, good conversation. Yeah, okay. Um, I guess my biggest constructive piece is, you know, learn English if you're going to put out a movie in America. I mean, come on. <laughs> um, also, it, it took me a good couple minutes to remember that Spanish language films, you know, Spanish or not Spanish, Italian origin films, uh, the audio tracks are almost never actually synced up to the lips. And I thought my file was corrupted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For for a fun piece of trivia, um, basically no Italian films like pre nineteen seventy five ish um, are filmed with audio. They are all, almost entirely, I should say, um, filmed without audio tracks and then overdubbed later. ADR baby. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why that was the process. I've never looked that far into it, but like you see in some like bigger Italian films that are in the English language, like the good, the bad and the ugly, um, or like pick your, um, Sergio Leone film. Uh, but this is also a good example of it. Um, once you get into like the 1980s though, and uh, like cinema paradiso at that point, they, I, they just record it with the dialogue. So I don't know what changed. I don't know my Italian cinema history well enough. I failed you as a co-host and a friend. I don't know any Italian film history. You know Sergio Leone. It's true. I do know Sergio Leone. I and, like Sergio Leone. And, and, um, and, now you, and now you know Federico Fellini. You're good friends. I now know two Italian filmmakers. So I know all the I, fake ones from uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Another Sergio Leone film? Oh, wait, no. That's, I'm thinking Once Upon a Time in America. My bad. Yeah, okay. There's too many Once Upon a Time movies. Isn't that the joke? I think so. Yes. <laughs> it's enough of one. I'll take it. We'll call it a joke. Um, so I want to ask you about what you thought of the choice of a sci-fi film as the um, film being made in the film. Um, because... It seems I, I can't tell if there's a reason behind it that something like uh you know, sci fi is scientific or it's it's colder, it's not personal. Um, because at the time we're not seeing sci fi as an emotional genre really. We're seeing mostly sci fi as like creature features and space aliens and shit like that. Star Trek um, I think at this point was around, but it wasn't really a very big series when it first came out. There's only 70 some odd episodes and Gene Roddenberry had to really fight for that. Um, so I'm wondering if it was a, in, an intentioned choice for lack of personality or if um, it was just there to be a vehicle for, man, look at all the money we spent making this goddamn rocket ship. What do you want to do with it, boss? Did, uh, did you did, were you thinking about it at all? I didn't think about it once watching the film. It really was just kind of a detail I accepted and not one that I questioned. Um, but thinking on it now, I feel like there's too much, you know, purposeful symbolism and detail for this film in this film for this to be coincidence, you know, a random draw. Uh, the idea that it is something that is considered impersonal and possibly a reason why he's having so much trouble finding inspiration for it makes a lot of sense. I would get that. Um, but I can't say I've had the time or, you know, thought processing to think on it. You know, the, 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 the two, the two, choices i gave you are not mutually exclusive the more i think about it the more i think it, it serves 
both of the purposes. I th- I think, and possibly also a third one, which is it's very easy to show, like when someone's in um, character, like in in costume, mm. because if you're wearing a goofy space costume, chances are you're an actor, and if you're not, uh, chances are you're not. Um, yeah, just to help differentiate those ideals. That's actually one thing that I, I really didn't like uh, about the film and, you know, the artistic choices behind it was I found it difficult and not entirely clear when it would switch over to a, you know, a dream sequence or a memory or whatever it was that you would want to consider them. Um, you know, maybe it's just because I'm so used to color film and the modern you know devices used to kind of express that but it just kind of it took me a while and i feel like i kind of spent too much time focusing on certain scenes thinking they were one thing only to realize they were something else and missing something who knows but it wasn't great uh i i understand um it's hard cuts to the memories of his childhood. And it's not like they can put the memories of black and white because the whole movie's in black and white. <laughs> so I get that. Um, I want to ask you about another small point from the film that I really like as an idea. Um, I forget what context it was in because there, there, there's plenty of religious symbolism in this film. There's a priest in this film. <laughs> there's a lot of religious symbolism in this film. But one of the points that got brought up that I think is kind of cool, or at least interesting, is the priest was saying, I forget, again, I forget if it was like the main, the cardinal, I forget what these Catholics are up to, um, that he was talking to brought it up, or if it was one of the other religious figures that brought it up. But the idea was that he was saying, um, shouldn't show so much uh romantic sex leisurely sex i think it was so- something like that casual sex in in films it should be more more uh romantic love or something something like that more more um affection and less like sexual desire or something like that and I, I i think i think we had brought it up with the cardinal maybe that's what it was because and i think that's a really interesting point because all right so it's like the 1960s Mm-hmm. And here's a guy that clearly values faith to some extent, you know, I, 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 cause if he didn't, this wouldn't even be part of the film. Um, and that sense of like religious morality by what the church tells you is your morality, um, involves not showing so much sex all the time. But at the same time, here is this guy on a quest for realism in what he whatever he's trying to do with his art and part of real life is sex and sexuality as is on display in this film it shows both sides um and i find i don't know i found that to be an interesting internal struggle did you think about it at all a little bit um i mean religion has never been my wheelhouse it never will be and it's not something you know i have ever connected to uh especially in in film just because i don't have that kind of experience and connection to it in my own life where it's meaningful to me and i can relate to you know either the symbolism or the message that they're trying to say um and i also just don't naturally know enough about it for it to make sense like talking to you know the cardinal and the priest and Like, I don't know the relationship or, like, what those positions represent. And so the discussions they have directly don't have the same weight to them. I don't know. I, If I'm honest, I kind of just glossed over it. I just didn't. It was like, yeah, okay, it's happening. I'm not going to dig into it. That's fine. I'm going to bring up a few more. Um Feel free to comment on them just as much as you feel like it. <laughs> um, sure. Uh, oh, fuck. I had my point in my notes. Where the fuck to go? <laughs> mm. Oh, um, I wrote down here about the uh, the scene where he has like all of the women in the room at the same time. Um, yes. And they're all like, 
carrying him around and like lovey dovey in him. And then they all start bringing up the shit things that he does and how he's kind of a dick and then start like throwing stuff at him and he gets a whip out and tries to whip him. And that, oh, that doesn't work. Um, what, what, what did you make out of that scene? Um, man, that's must be a pretty cool life. If, uh, <laughs> If that's something that you can not only like, yeah, I get it. Like there are plenty of men around that that is a, a fantasy for them. That is something they think about. And it's like, Oh, I wish I could have my own harem of, um, I guess harem is what they called it. Um, it's one of those things where, yeah, that's clearly the way he's handled his personal life. That is an honest representation of what it might seem you know, interpersonally where he has to juggle all this and all that comes from it is people that could to some degree look at him and respect him for all of the good he does just end up getting burned and their relationships are soured and they have these negative feelings towards them. And I don't know. I feel like a lot of it is stuff he should be talking about with a therapist. Um, oh, that's the whole movie. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this was his discussion. Like, he goes in for a consultation, like a first consultation with a therapist, and you know, normally you talk things out, do this, do that, and he's just like, "No, we're gonna, I'm gonna pay you for a double session, uh, and we're gonna watch this movie, and then you'll kind of just know the gist of it." Um, but yeah, you know, uh, I. Right. I think, well, for, first of all, uh, to to one of the, <laughs> the points that you brought up, I think this exercise in, in realism and the quest for reality is, is, is a therapy session for him. This is all like, man, I got, I got to work out some shit, uh, which is emphasized, I think, by this scene in particular, where I think he's f- coming to the conclusion, um, or at least it's being forced upon him, the idea that, hey, buddy, you are the greatest common denominator. <laughs> you you are the only thing that unites these women and their hatred is you uh, and your actions and the way you've treated them. Um, and and he tries to and he starts lashing out at them with a literal whip. <laughs> um, and uh, and but but he's been a dick to all of them. And he had to reconcile with the fact that he can he can move on, he can jump ship from what, however many women he feels the need to jump ship from. But the common denominator, buddy, it's always you. <laughs> uh, I've I've got more, um, but like like we said, this film is so much metaphor. Um, is there anything you have? Yeah, let me actually go back to my notes. Um, this guy's style. And specifically the sunglasses, those rectangular sunglasses that he wears throughout. Man, I I am envious of just the style and confidence that that man just naturally has. Same. Oh, my God. What a look. Like, he can be such a complete goof in crazy situations and never loses an ounce of composure or class. It's fantastic. Does all um, those goofy, like, fucking walks and stretch and shit, and then someone calls his name and he turns around, and he turns around like the coolest man on the planet. Right, and like situations that are incredibly awkward, like your wife meeting your known mistress and saying hello, and oh, it's so nice to see you. I've been waiting for this for so long. And they both look over, wave, and he's just like having a ball, just goofing off in the ads. And it's, you know, situations that are, for most people, incredibly stressful. He's just like, ah, not a care in the world, playing it off, roll it right down your back have a good time he's just here to enjoy life um and that's what makes him such a fun character to watch because if any of us were in that situation we would be either sweating bullets and or having a heart attack so you know it's nice to uh not have to worry about the stress there um also the absolute balls on this man to invite his wife up to the movie set where he's also hosting his mistress that she knew about later on what? Like how he brings his mistress up to stay there, like the the chick he's seeing, Carla. Oh yeah, yeah. 
and then he's on the phone with his wife. He invites his wife up to the same location. Like, hey, babe, I want to see you. Come up. It would make me happy. No, I do want you to come. Come up, come up, come up. And then having his wife there and his mistress mistress there at the same time, just like, yeah, fuck it. It'll work out. Don't give a shit. The ball on that man. <laughs> man, this was this was Italy in the sixties, and he was a good looking white dude. There's no rules. All right, touche. <laughs> you make a fair point. That that is all I can make out of that situation. <laughs> yeah, you know, at the end of the day, he is just a successful dude, just trying to have a good time, get laid, and find some inspiration for a movie. What could he ask for? Exactly. Any any other notes? Um, I do want to talk about the ending, just because it's the ending, and I feel like we should, and then we can we can wrap it up. Um, anything else you want to bring up? No, those are my notes. Very few. All right, so so the the uh, the movie ends um, with oh geez, where to how where to even do they even go with it? Um, they all lived happily ever after. Kinda, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Guido. Calls off the film, um, and they have a there's a press conference, and Guido like runs away, and he crawls under a table and shoots himself in the head, um, and then, um, he comes out. Of, I don't even know. Actually, now that I'm thinking about, it, I'm not even sure how he gets to the part with the clowns. But at so at some point, <laughs> at some point, him and and his wife Louisa um, are hanging out, and a group of clowns led by young Guido, the childhood version of himself, um, transform like the set of the movie into a circus, and all the characters from the film all come out with, like with some. Some kind of clownish people. I uh, were there clowns now. I can't remember if I'm just making that part up. Doesn't matter. And like there's like carnival music happenings or circus music or whatever. And they start. And Guido starts like to like be a director and like tell them all where to go. And then they end up in a big circle holding hands, um, listening to 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 carnival music. Um, while and then Guido and Carla join join in. It was a weird ending. Mm -hmm. It was something. And, uh, you know, there have been movie endings that I've understood better. There are movie endings I've understand less. Um, but, yeah, this was definitely more of the, the low end of understanding, where it's just kind of like I'm not... Like, at that point, I kind of picked up on the, okay, this is a very symbolic movie. All of this has deeper meaning, yada, 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 whatever. Um, I'm still very much missing what that whole ending represented. All right. So here's here's my take on it. Guido has finally come to the understanding that he shouldn't make a sci-fi movie. <laughs> That for whatever reason he is incapable of making this film, so he calls it off um, for personal reasons, and he then wants, in his continuing quest for realism, has to has all of these characters and um, people all at once that you've seen throughout the film all kind of pour into into view. Um, because that's his life. Because the sci-fi film he was trying to make isn't his life. These people around him are all his life. And as much of a circus as life can be, um, it's made up of all of these peoples and memories that all form a complete picture. Um, and I think that's what the circle represents. Uh, like That it is... My my no my actual last note here is uh life is a uh life is a circle life is a circus people matter more than you think um because it seems like life is the highway I want to ride it all night long all night long uh thanks Mister Flats 
Uh, you are welcome. And so I, I think the, the idea here is that he, he's trying to make a complete picture, which I think is represented by the circle. Again, this is what I'm getting out of it. Um, and to do that, he needs all of these experiences and people that he interacts with to all be a part of that. And I think if there was a, a, a scene that followed it, it would be Guido preparing to make eight and a half. Okay, sure. Because that's, that's, that's basically what this movie is, you know what I mean? That quest for truth and realism and all that shit. Yeah, all right. It makes a lot of sense. It, again, it's one of those it's one of those films that I just do not connect with on that extra level and it's more of a yeah, okay, I can accept that rather than oh, you know, that it speaks to me, that makes sense, you know. I I totally get it, man. This is uh like we've kind of been saying, this is this is right on the line between um, normal film that has metaphor and a wildly metaphoric experience <laughs> where the plot doesn't quite matter so much. It's like right in between. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, give me a give me a final rating and review, and we'll talk about another movie. Um, you know, it's uh. It's a whether you connect to it or not, it's still an extremely enjoyable film with wildly enjoyable characters. And at the end of the day, even though I feel like I need to watch this two, three, four more times to to really get it at that next level, I don't think there was ever a point where I thought, wow, this is a bad movie or this is something I would change, this is something I would fix yada 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 whatever it may be i still really enjoyed the hell out of this movie and so i'll give this one uh i'll give it a three you know i i feel like it's something that will gradually increase the more i see it um this could easily end up being something like a four when you know it's all said and done and i i don't know finalize my reviews die whatever uh but for now it's a three all right um I respect it. Uh, I I think this is such a brilliantly made film. Again, whether whether it connects with you so strictly or not, like there there's 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 no wrong answers. I think for how much or how little you connect with this. Um, but, so wherever you fall on that spectrum, um, the fi- as as a as a piece of filmmaking, I think this is amazing. I think it does what it does exceedingly well. I think the concepts are presented in a way that is attainable without giving it like if if you like critical thinking uh, and and deciphering metaphor, this is a great film for you. If you don't, this is still a good movie. I think this is still there for you. Um because the plot moves in a logical enough way and there's enough other shit that happens that you can just sit back and appreciate this being a good movie. Um, it, it It's however much or however little I think you, ne- you need it to be. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give, give it a f- fuck. Um, I'm between four and four and a half. And I, um, I'm going to give it a four and a half. I've decided lock it in. Um, cool. It's a great fucking movie. I love this fucking movie. Um, oh, yeah, that's all I got to say. Shall we talk about the next one? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, Frost Nixon was made in 2008, directed by Ron Howard, written by Peter Morgan, starring Frank Langella, Michael Sheen, Kevin Bacone, and others. Um, it had an estimated budget of $25 million, a cumulative worldwide gross of $27.4 million. So it made its money back and not much more, Um, which is fine. Does it have a tagline? It does. Oh, it's actually a good tagline. An epic battle for truth. Yeah, that makes sense. 
I think I actually genuinely think that's a good tagline. Um, it is short, it is concise, and it is true. <laughs> um, where it's definitely corny, but at the same time, it's fitting enough where I I would say it's a good one. Yeah, it's a good one. I think like ninety percent of taglines are corny, and I think it's because of the nature of a tagline. It's right. just a it's a corny thing to have. Not that you're wrong to have it, but it's definitely corny. Yeah, um, it was nominated for Best Motion Picture of the Year for Brian Gaze, Grazer, Ron Howard, and Eric Fellner. It was nominated for Best Performance by an Actor in a Leading Role for Frank Langella, uh, Best Achievement in Directing for Ron Howard, Best Writing for Peter Morgan, and Best Achievement in Film Editing for Mike Hill and Daniel P. Hainley. It is about a, it is a dramatic retelling of the post-Watergate television interviews between British talk show host David Frost and former President Richard M. Nixon. Corwin, what did you think of this film? I always have to go first. You always do. Hmm, I don't like that. I, really I can like go first. first. You, do you want me to go first? Yeah, you know what? I started, but now you get to go first. Go ahead. Have fun. Knock it out of the park, kiddo. <laughs> It's the kiddo that got me. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. I have my mouth open to talk. <laughs> uh, anyway, all right. <laughs> anyway, um, this is by far the most interesting film about a four-part interview with a former president <laughs> you are ever going to watch. On the surface, that is such a boring subject. <laughs> Yeah. I and I would think I thought about it relentlessly throughout watching this this film. Um, this pitch now, granted, this was a, a very successful play on Broadway before it became a film, so I'm sure that the movie pitch wasn't actually all that bold. Um, it was just like, "Hey, you, you seen that play? Let's make it a movie." Um, but if that play didn't exist, the pitch for this movie sounds insane mm-hmm. um, because. I am sure that these interviews were significant. Um, apparently, David Frost made a lot of money off of them, so I'm sure they had a lot of viewership. I've seen this film several times. I've still never watched those interviews. Um, they never came up in my history classes. Um, they never. I, I didn't know they existed. And yeah, yeah. And then, like, I've seen this film several times. I've still never watched his fucking interviews. Um, so it's crazy to take what is a non major point in US history that is these interviews that talk about for only a very small portion a major point in US history that is Watergate um and the rest of it is a talk show host trying to get the interviews paid for and Nixon blathering um does not sound like it's going to be a very captivating film. And yet, it's such a good fucking movie. It's such a good fucking movie. They make these interviews feel like it's the bottom of the ninth inning. I, oh, and yeah. it's perfect. It's the, the stakes in all reality aren't very high. This isn't a trial. Um, worst comes to worst these people don't get paid and that sucks, but it's not like any, it's, it's not like anyone will go to jail. It would just be unfortunate. Um, so the stakes are pretty fucking low. Uh, and, and yet it feels like they're super high in all the best ways. Um, it's a great telling of this story. I think it does a real, a lot of really interesting things with the character, Richard Nixon, that I'm sure we're going to talk about. And again, it gets into a very big part, a very big part of U S history because well, Richard Nixon is the first and unfortunately only president to have resigned. Um, so the fact that ah, I'm praying for it, um, to whatever loose concept of a God we have, but I, uh, I couldn't. You, I don't think you could possibly ask for more out of this film in particular. Um, ooh, that's an interesting concept. Um, yeah, I don't know where else you would really go with it. At least in like this structure, at least maybe you could do you know the whole concept of 
these interviews, you could switch it up, whatever you want to do. But yeah, like this was a very, I guess I'll say fulfilling film where I never saw this movie when it came out or up until now, because again, the concept is, you know, you read the description of a movie before you watch it. And it's like, I, why would I ever watch this? This seems like a waste of two hours of my life. Obviously now, you know, years later, I'm significantly more into politics and that side of the the world compared to when this came out. But wow, the, the characterization that they do in this film is, you know, the shining star, like the the aspect of this that I feel like did it for me, you know, watching this film. The two the two heads in this, you know, Frost, David Frost and Richard Nixon, their back and forth, their relationship and how you connect to the both of them is fascinating. You know, I watched this three, four days ago and caught myself today thinking about some of the things that they had said to each other and, you know, the the strategization of, you know, the mind games involved with putting one of them on edge for like you said what by all means is nothing spectacular it's an interview it's one guy asking a question one guy's answering the vast majority of which are never going to be seen by anyone outside of that room while it's being taped um and boy it it turned nothing into something and i think that was excuse me the best part of it, you know, like you have movies like Spotlight where it's a group of people researching a subject, trying to find justice. And, you know, the search is what they focus on because that has, you know, a natural ebb and flow of we need to find this. Otherwise, we have nothing. When we do find it, we can have success, yada, yada, yada. With this, it's like the information's there. We know what happened everyone knows what happened it's we need to break him as a person and get him to snap and admit to knowingly committing these crimes as the president of the united states and it was different enough of a concept that it was interesting it was unique uh and the way they did it was excellent i really enjoyed this yeah just just to uh, uh a comment on on how the way they made this is uh, Jesus Christ. These sentences aren't coming out great. Um, ah, welcome the to I- the club, buddy boy. I know, right? The idea of having uh, like in uh, documentary style interviews with the actors playing the characters as the future version of those characters is also like a great choice. It's an easy way to give it exposition without it feeling like unnatural in the slightest. Yeah. Um, the fact that like it wasn't ever explained. Not that it really needed to be. Um, why they were giving those documentary style interviews doesn't fucking matter. You accept that based on how this film set up, and it did it in a in such a seamless way that, like, again, why were they being interviewed? <laughs> it did. It doesn't matter. Um, but it's it's a it's an accomplishment that they could make it not matter. Um, I want to actually kind of jump into one of the bigger points of this film because uh, Kel and I were talking about it um, after while we were watching it. And she she said, oh, I feel so bad for Richard Nixon. And I was like, you really shouldn't. <laughs> and she was like, but he looks so sad. And in my view, they make Richard Nixon look sad be, as, as, as a way of that being a detriment to his character. Because if he didn't show any remorse, if he didn't look beat, he wouldn't have been beat legally he got away with it and he he had the moral or sorry the 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 quote unquote ethical justifications out the wazoo on it as got put on display in this film for Mm -hmm. everything david frost brought up he had an ethical justification for that in his mind made it okay so there's no reason for him to be sad unless he knew he did the wrong thing And that regret and sadness is an admission of guilt. And that's what I think the film's trying to show you. It's not meant to be sympathetic 
towards Richard Nixon, it's meant to show you that he knew what he did. Yeah. He knew he was wrong. And that that knowledge is manifested through mopey, I'm so old, Richard Nixon. Yeah, What'd you one think of those things it? where I definitely noticed it, and I noticed them trying to draw out those emotions to different extents throughout, and it was something I made note of where when you start out the movie, the Richard Nixon they introduce you to is a piece of shit, a greedy, you know, unrelenting, just asshole, essentially, you know? Um, and at the end, they really do try to get you to connect to him to relate to the broken Richard Nixon that has, you know, admitted all sins and is asking to be forgiven. And while to some extent, you know, I am, we've talked about, you know, our progressive beliefs on here. I'll never going to forgive Richard Nixon. Like he is, you know, he committed treason by all means against the United States. You know, it's, it's not something that can be forgiven. It shouldn't be forgiven. It's definitely not something that should be pardoned because he was your boss at one point and you just are sick and tired of talking about it. But man, it's just, I wish they were able, like the only thing I wish was that they were able to find a way to both show that sadness, but not have it come toe to toe with, or come, you know, bundled with people feeling bad for him and having that, you know, emotion towards him because he doesn't deserve it. No, no, he does not. He, he carpet bombs an entire nation. We were not at war with due to faulty information that he didn't bother verifying and killing many civilians along the way. The massive expansion of Vietnam. Oh God. I, He's he's a clown. Uh, he committed war crimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He should have died in jail. Uh, not to mention the whole water. Like Watergate is so by far the least of what you should be mad at Richard Nixon for, um, because that was just political and didn't like kill people. Um, but anyway, I wouldn't say it's the least, but you know, it's it's still significantly important, and the precedent of getting away with it is not something that you know to this day is fucking us up but yeah like there are significantly worse things that he did yeah um and i i think this so it one of the one of the main characters uh sam rockwell's character made the point that this was to be the the trial that that nixon never never got or it really never had to answer to. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like they accomplished that, though? Because as, as severe and admittance-ridden as the final interview is, he got bullied in the first one, David Frost did. Yep. And the second one didn't really seem from how they show it in the film. Again, have not seen it. The... Uh, yeah, actual interviews, but it didn't really seem like he did that great in the second interview, too. And if you get walked all over like that by uh, a defendant, I guess we could say. Mm -hmm. And we're not talking about like days one and two of Watergate. They were days one and two about specific topics that did not get revisited later on in the interview process. I'm not sure that it was a great demonstration of the trial that Nixon was never forced to partake in. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, it's one of those things where if you suck for the first three quarters of the game and then come back in the fourth quarter, it only makes up for the first three if you if you win the game. And to that point, it really goes to you know how much you value him admitting that guilt and how much you think he did admit guilt with the way he at least in this, phrased his regret and, you know, uh, however you want to put it, 
personally, I think it's a win just because that admission is enough. You know, if you're charged for crimes and then spend, you know, three 90 minute sessions, three 90 minute interviews, basically saying, nope, wasn't me. I had reason to do it. Oh, didn't break the law. And then right at the end, you're like, well, I kind of did do all those things and I feel real bad about it. It, it kind of just makes the rest of it moot. Um, you know, it that is bigger than lying about something for, you know, hours on end, even if it is what people are watching. I don't know. Shit. So it doesn't it doesn't really get very much into who David Frost is as a person, which I think is exactly right. I don't think it matters. And that's the, the, that's, uh, no. that, it's the tough part about this because understanding that David Frost is not a classical interviewer, that he is a talk show host, I think adds some intrigue into the fact that these interviews took place. But when it comes time for the interviews to actually happen, doesn't add anything, nor really subtract anything. I don't know. Do, do you think him, his previous experience as like comedy talk show host really matter at all here? Um, I don't think it's his experiences with comedy as much as his lack of experience with political discussion and interviewing and you know, it's very noticeable the level of manipulation that's easily achievable for someone like Richard Nixon, who's been in that political space for so many years that it's, you know, second nature to him. Whereas, you know, a guy like David Frost, who's, you know, they show him having a really serious conversation about this fucking, like, boat or something like that's his experience that's his abilities um it it definitely can give you an understanding for why richard nixon is sweeping the floor with him in the first couple episodes of this interview um and why it's so difficult to get him to answer in a way that supports their you know their goals uh, but yeah, I don't think it, it in and of itself uh, does anything major for the story other than that explanation. Yeah, I think. Again, I think I think it adds to the overall. What am I trying to say here? I think it makes the film more interesting because it's like hey look at this guy that doesn't do this who's gonna go do this i think the only moment of or only part of the interview that makes that he really feels like out of his element is the first interview that they show where he just kind of walked over because a, a late night talk show host not named jimmy fallon wouldn't interrupt their guests you know, you'd let them tell their story and sit there and then wait till they're politely finished and then tell a joke. Um, and that's not what you should do when a guy's talking about war crimes and that he's just totally cool with. <laughs> that he did. Um, and in that respect, it showed. Um, but I feel like you also kind of knew that one was coming because, like, he's a talk show host who was last seen in Australia doing Australian game shows. Um, but it definitely it introduces a certain setting that I think is fun. It's like the whole party right. scene. It's very, very not who Nixon is, and it becomes a talking point. Like, I wish I was more like you. I'm so sad. I killed all those Cambodians. Um, but as I'm, as I guess what I'm trying to say is like they did such a good job making this movie about Richard Nixon and also very much so not about Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. I don't really know what to say. Man, just like jumping to a whole new point, that conversation they do have at the end, their you know their final conversation together, where Nixon does say to Frost, you know, you 
you really do enjoy like these lavish parties, like these wild social events that you host, like you, that is something like, that's a part of you that you enjoy, man, you just don't know how lucky you are. And at the time it was like, yeah, wow, that like makes sense. Um, you know, a guy like Richard Nixon, that level of notoriety and that level of, um, I guess, how do you want to put it? Just the amount to which he has to socialize with significant amounts of other people. Yeah, I could see that being fucking awful if it's not something that you actually enjoy. And it's something that, like, even today, like, days after is like, wow, like, I was caught, I caught myself thinking, like, man, like, the ability to like people and be liked by people, you know, is something that, in all honesty, uh, is a skill that a significant amount of people just do not possess. And I could see why, like, people that don't have it, and, you know, myself included, just would be envious of having that, you know, level of both confidence and social skills. It is relatively an odd part, though, because Richard Nixon wasn't a bad guy because he wasn't fun at parties. He's a bad guy because he killed a lot of people. And I'm not saying that you're, that's your point. But I'm saying it's a weird thing for the film to be like, hey, like Richard Nixon really struggled in social situations. When it's like, yeah, man, but like no social situation call for the bombing of Cambodia. It's not well, like all the go- jocks were hanging out like, man, I just bombed Indonesia. I just, I just bombed Taiwan. And Nixon was like, I'll show them. I mean, I think that's just them trying to, you know, change the image of Richard Nixon that they're portraying, like, throughout the movie, where, yeah, you see Richard Nixon as the piece of shit that he rightfully is, and then when you get to these final scenes, they are showing him as being a relatable person with, you know, as much as you want to argue for or against that, you know, they do make him relatable like you can understand some of the struggles that he's facing you know like not being able to enjoy the shoes that he likes because the people around him think they're too effeminate and whatever you want like whatever shit you want to pull from that but at the end of the day they do make him someone you can relate to as a viewer um and at the end of the day like it's a statement that he makes about you know ability to like people and be liked that regardless of who says it is it's a factual statement all right hold on i have a new take i want to i want to propose to you okay all right they brought that up because nixon in that in that scene you know the 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 you're lucky to enjoy party scene is admitting his faults and you see him as a sympathetic creature for that and if he had just done that much earlier, he probably wouldn't have been viewed so negatively by the public in the first place. Sure, absolutely. I Be- think if, uh, you know, Richard Nixon invaded Cambodia, realized, you know, hey, this is going poorly. This is not what we had thought. Shit, guys, I fucked up. That's on me. I did this. I shouldn't have. I'm sorry. I won't do it again. People would have been like, all right, Richard Nixon. You know, you didn't know there was some guys going into that hotel room. We believe you. Or, you know, actually being able to say, oh, wow, the president has a quality that I envy where he can admit faults. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it, it's like if Richard Nixon truly believed his intel that he had, that there was a Viet Cong headquarters in Cambodia and bombed the shit out of it for that. And then upon finding out that it was bad intel was like, holy shit, this was a colossal oversight by the Department of Defense and myself as president. These decisions are mine. I am going to institute um, policy changes and tighten up the intel. I'm going to uh, give more aid to Cambodia. We're going to work with local leaders on creating our reconstruction efforts for for those regions and financial aid packages to help amend the destruction. Blah, 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 blah. 
regret and actionable uh, steps to help make up for the wrongdoings you transgressed, that is respectable. That is you admitting that there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. That, that That's <laughs> understandable to a certain extent, the scale and scope being a difficult hurdle. But Nixon never did that. He he was like, no, we yeah, totally, I mean, he, we did bomb Cambodia because we should have, I'd have bombed Cambodia sooner. Um, and that's the whole thing. Like, people understand fuck-ups because people fuck up. If you present it as a fuck up instead of digging your heels in being a big dick, big old dick. I mean, yes, he could do that, or he could sabotage peace talks and you know drag out the war so that he could get reelected. What? Either or. In this economy, <laughs> he would never. Tricky Dick would never do that. My mother has only ever referred to Richard Nixon as Tricky Dicky. That is a, an incredibly your mother thing to do. I love that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm also a fan of Bill Clinton's uh, Slippery Willie. That's another one I've yeah. heard. Yeah, yeah, a little, little dirtier, I'll say. Oh, a little? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Also, just something I'd like to point out. As much as you can, you know, hate on his policies and decisions and lying and everything that was Richard Nixon as a president, resigning in disgrace for committing treason against this country and then throwing up twin deuces like peace, see you later, uh, as you walk onto the Marine One and fly away. God, what a bad look. What a dick thing to do. Uh, he didn't think he did anything wrong. <laughs> that That's the thing yeah. of it. You know, Agnew had to, had to um, resign for completely unrelated reasons. Nixon had to resign in shame. And the only reason he resigned, in all likelihood, was because uh, that was the only way he was going to get a pardon from, from Gerald Ford and not face jail time. Um, because someone else in government had a spine, um, or at least had the ability to say, dude, you done fucked up, get out of town. Um, and, oh, how I wish we had that. Um, oh, so close. Yeah. Uh, the only impressive thing about Richard Nixon is the fact that he won 49 states. Which is insane. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, and then he, and then Reagan did it all, in, like, what, 15, 16 years later? Ridiculous. The I, the concept in today's politics of one candidate mm-hmm. winning 49 states is insane to me. Like, I, I can't wrap my head around it. Yeah, it's, um, I don't even... I it, like I don't know George McGovern, the guy he beat well, or you know really anything about him. How unlikable of a candidate do you have to be to get to that where you can only win a singular state? You can't even win your own state. You win Democrat, you know, ingrained Massachusetts, and that's it. Which is funny that Democrat and Grain Massachusetts then voted for Reagan's re-election. Reagan, Don't who won 45 states his first time and then 49 states his second time. Just mind-blowing. Again, I can't... I just can't wrap my head around it. It's so bananas. Um, yeah, I, I, I understand it's tough to vote out an incumbent, but at the same time, it's like, like you said, how much do people have to either hate you or just love Richard Nixon that you lose all states but one. It seems like a scathing comment, but man, uh, I feel bad. How do you even go home that night? <laughs> right? How do you go like, ah, oh, we tried. Did you? If I put if I put Corwin Heller on the ballot today, um, on like the Democratic ticket, you you would win several states. Like if I was the only Democrat, on yeah, the ticket? yeah, no, on the de- yeah, you, you, yeah. for a Democrat, the president. 
Um, I feel like I would still be able to win the presidency. That's what I'm saying. You'd have a sh- like. That's how. Granted, this is an especially divisive election, but like, that's how divisive politics is now. I can't imagine like, man. I just can't imagine like New York State going red or California going red right now. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. That's so not the point. Uh, <laughs> what do you think of the movie? Give me a rating and review. Uh, I really like it. I think that I don't even know who the actor's name was. I forgot to look it up since then. Um, I love his performance. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. Um, Frank Langella? Oscar nomination worthy. I'm not going to say it was... Should have won. I don't know who he was up against. But Michael Sheen? Definitely. I'm sorry? Wh- which guy? The guy who played Nixon. Oh, Frank Langella. He, he, he was Oscar nominated. Ooh, who won that year? Oh, that's a great question. I don't even know what movies were out in 2008. Um, I do have the um, Oscar noms up, though, so I can... Uh, navigate my way over there pretty quick. Actually, 2008, I want to say it was uh, Sean Penn for Milk. That's my guess. Locking it in. Mm. It was Sean Penn for Milk! Oh my god, I win. That was a beautiful Incredible. moment. Uh, also nominated that year, uh, Richard Jenkins for The Visitor, Brad Pitt for The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, and Mickey Rourke for The Wrestler. Oof. That's a... Uh, that's a very... Uh, that's a pretty wild... All around. Uh, yeah, big old group. Ugh, group of nominees, excuse me. Um, but yeah, I, I thought that was a spectacular performance. Um, there's not a whole lot that I dislike. Um, man, I'm just trying to read through my notes real quick to see if there was anything that, that I missed. You know, like, looking at the, the way his advisors look at him with the reverence that... Uh, I'm, I swear I'm not getting into politics. It's just a, an observation on the truth. Uh, the way Trump's advisors look at him, you know, look at him as a god, as someone above all else, just they revere him. It, it, it's that same look. Um, but yeah, I, I, I can't get past the, you know, technical side. It's nothing great. It's just the, the acting performance by these two marquee actors in this it, it, it was great yeah these these two uh michael sheen who plays david frost and frank langella who plays nixon these two were the two guys who starred in the stage production that got adapted into this film so these are two oh, actors wow. who worked with each other extensively on these roles in particular which i think really plays well um in this awesome. this film adaptation yeah yeah it really it it shows the the rapport that they have with each other in the scenes which they communicate um, outside of the interview are flawless. You, uh, I think Michael Sheen does a just such a great job trying to get a sense of where Nixon's head is at and how he's supposed to respond because despite the fact that Nixon is a war criminal, he's still like <laughs> the president of the United States and it's odd to have to interact politely with someone like that. It's like the moment mm-hmm. that Sam Rockwell's character had when he was first about to meet Richard Nixon and his co-researcher was like, are you going to shake his hand? And Rockwell was like, no, that war criminal, like, fuck that man. I'm not shaking his fucking hand. He didn't drop any F-bombs. But like, you get what I'm saying. Um, and then Nixon yeah. comes in comes in, and he's just like so struck with the moment, he shakes his hand. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what I think most people would probably do at least feel maybe not do but at least you'd feel that um and it yeah. so it's cool to see again maybe not with this president but you know it, right that's what i was just gonna say yeah like, man any other president like there's a lot of presidents i've disagreed with you know if i met them i'd still shake their hand this one's a little different yeah a little um different. L- little bit um but it's it's so it's cool to it's it's really cool to see Michael Sheen's char- um, character, David Frost, have to kind of like be like, all right, how are we communicating today? It's interesting seeing Frank Langella drop like little mind games like, oh, did you, did you fornicate last night? That's a great mm-hmm. line. <laughs> that's Checking a- out his wife. Hey, you fuck your wife. That's a, that's a great, it was a great moment. Um, so, yeah, uh, yeah, I thoroughly enjoy this. Did, did you give a rating? I forgot. I didn't. I'm going to give it a four. I am going to give it 
Oh, three and a half. I'm going to go slightly under you. Three, three and a half. I don't have a great reason. Um, maybe because as much as I think this is so fucking well done, it is still tame in its scope um, and limited in its scope. Not Again, nothing wrong with that. I, again, I think this is the most they could have possibly gotten out of this film, and it's so good. Um, but it is a very, very narrow view of this period in time and the characters involved with it. Um, like, this this shouldn't be the first thing you watch about Watergate. Uh, I watched this with uh, with a friend, and they were like, I didn't know he resigned. What? I didn't know he was the only one to resign. What? Uh, I died a little inside. Who was this? I don't want to say. Name names. Uh, off air. I am Joseph I will not McCarthy. dox someone on You air. are Ilya Kazan. Name names. No, sir. I am not a snitch publicly. Privately, I will just let loose. Stop being Arthur Miller, Arthur Miller and become Ilya Kazan. I demand this. <laughs> I hope people understand this reference. Anyway, um, all right, buddy. Any anything? Oh, movies for next week. Um, am I picking a number, or do you have one locked in already? Ooh, yeah. No, let me bring it up. I want you to pick a number. All right. Um, one to I'm thirty a, this week. I had a lot of movies. Uh, it's out of how many? Thirty. 2026. 26. Ooh. The Graduate. Oh, such a good movie. Oh, I'm excited. All right, cool, cool. Corwin's got The Graduate, uh, 1967. I'm going to pick a recent film that I have not seen yet, just to mix it up. I'm going to go with um, An American Pickle, the new Seth Rogen film. Ah. Nice. I'm actually watching, uh, not watching, but like there is an ad for it in front of my face as we speak. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I activated my HBO Max account. Not that now that HBO Go is out the door, um, and uh, I forgot I would have access to HBO Max since I had HBO I Go. A hundred percent agree. I just figured that out today. Yeah, yeah. So I that's how I actually that's actually how I watched Eight and a Half. It's on HBO Max. Um, uh. Yeah, because I thought I had it. Because I have a I have a Federico Fellini folder in my um, hard drive that does not have eight and a half in it. It has three other movies. Because of course. Um, and I was like, well, fuck me. And luckily, it was on HBO Max. So I was like, oh shit, I should like watch one of the, the all some of this original content. So, American Pickle on HBO Max. That's my pick. Nice. Toit toit toit. Uh, our- toit 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 toit. All right. Um, anything else for what is the pen ultimate episode of the movies edition of the podcast? For for now. For now. Uh, no. Uh, yeah, it's been fun. I can't wait to uh, never do this with you again. On on Thursdays. <laughs> on Thursdays, yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, so we're we're gonna rec- we're gonna release the next movies edition still. On Juice the Numbers, still next Thursday. Uh, but that is, as we are planning it right now, going to be the last Thursday Movies podcast as we transition to Tuesday's Movies podcasts under a different name. More information to be released at a later date. <laughs> We're going to DFA B, the Movies Edition. Um, anyway, oh, that's it. Uh, if you want to follow the show on Twitter, you can do so at Juice and Pod. If you want to via email, you can do so at juice the numbers at gmail.com. And until Monday, y'all have a good one. Bye.